The benefits of getting paid first, just like the bank does, big and wealthy, they get paid first, but you still get some of the taste of the benefits of being the investor too, in a really conservative risk adjusted way. You're listening to The Life and Money Show, a podcast that brings you the stories and strategies of people who are living a meaningful and intentional life by design, building true wealth for their families and impacting the world around them. And now here are your hosts. Hey everyone, Annie Dickerson here. And on behalf of the entire Good Egg Investments team, I wanted to welcome you to another episode of the Life and Money Show, where we talk about everything from investing to financial freedom, to parenting, traveling, creating a life by design, and everything in between. I'm here with my amazing co-host, Susan Elliott. Susan, how are you today? I'm doing really good. It's a fully optimized Tuesday, which maybe Wednesday (laughs) will be fully non-optimized, but one day at a time. (laughs) <laughs> One day at a time. I already hit the gym. I did some training. I look at spent you. Some really good time with my kiddos. I woke up too early, but yeah, it was great. How about you? How are you today? I am surprisingly awake despite all the disturbances to my sleep from my, I think she's now 10 week old puppy who actually woke up almost on the hour last night. So I was up at one o'clock, two o'clock, three thirty, five thirty. Every time she's just like, what? Me? Yeah, just me. Just me here. And I'm am. like, ah. <laughs> that just sends like shock waves of remembering the newborn stage of yes. raising the kids of like sleep deprivation, sort of, oh, oh gosh. Oh gosh. Oh, oh gosh. gosh. Okay. We have yes. it good. We're a little bit further out of that stage. But sleep yeah. is so essential. I think that as a 20 something, even 30 something, you can read as much as you want about how important sleep is until you are interrupted every hour of the night Mm -hmm. and are awake for 15 to 20 minutes every hour of the night. That is a different deep level of understanding the quality (laughs) of sleep. I remember when I had my first child reading that it was every two hours they would wake up, but nobody told me that sometimes the whole like feeding and changing them and getting back to sleep would take maybe an hour, but then they still wake up from when you first started. So it's not like you have a full two hours in between. It was just, oh, what an adjustment. You just can't understand it until you're in it. And then it's just quite amazing, actually, when you are in it, how you can still be an adult and have conversations. (laughs) I mean, at some moments you just kind of break down, but then you're like, okay, I'm on 3.2 hours spread out over seven here we go. This is going to work. Just like I said, I still feel the gratitude for every night that I sleep through or get some good solid four hour stretches in at least with having two young kids at home. And as I train in athletics more and people say, yes, yes, sleep, you have to rest, you have to recover. I'm like, amen, of course. (laughs) Like, you cannot take sleep away and put like a workout. And I would have done that right. 15 years ago. I would have done oh, that yeah. five years ago before my daughter mm-hmm. was born. And it's just not possible. So, well, we're both here. And yeah, I was thinking about the focus topic for today, which is this exciting new emerging opportunity around preferred or pref equity. And I was actually thinking about my puppy and how in some ways she's like the pref equity in our family, if you think about it, right? Because like- (laughs) She gets paid first. Right, she gets paid (laughs) first. She gets all the attention for right now, at least while she's a puppy because she has all these needs and she's kind of like top of the capital stack, so to speak, right, right now. But anyway, we'll get into all that. Oh my goodness. Is there an analogy like spelling bee that we can enter you in at some point? I mean. Oh my gosh. I would totally crush that. I would love that. Puns and analogies. Totally my jam. So yes, today we're talking about pref equity, which is something that is fairly new to all of us. Actually, I mean, It's something that's been around certainly for a long time, but at every part of the market cycle, you've got to look up and take a look at whether what you're doing still makes sense or whether there are new and emerging opportunities. And that's exactly what we found with Pref Equity. So I'm excited to dive in today. For anybody who might be interested in what we're talking about today and might be interested in investing alongside us, there's two resources that I want to point you to. One is for any of our existing opportunities, whether pref equity or otherwise, 
The best place to learn about what's currently open and what's coming up is to go to our website and our open deals page, which you can access directly at goodagginvestments.com slash deals. And for anybody who's hearing about this opportunity that's coming up around Pref Equity that we haven't launched yet, but maybe you're interested and you want to kind of get on the list and save your spot, we've currently put out a survey to the Good Egg community and the Life and Money Show community to see who might be interested in investing alongside us. So if you're interested, especially after listening to our conversation here today, we invite you to go and fill out that survey. Let us know if you're interested. You can access that at goodegginvestments.com slash, okay, you ready? It's easy, but it's got a few different parts. Pref-equity-survey. Okay. I tried to make it as easy as I could people, but at least it's not Google dot four, seven, five, nine pound two. So HB, right. Okay. Just one F two, right? (laughs) One One F. F Yes. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. Yes. So goodegginvestments.com slash pref dash equity dash survey. We'll have that link for you in the show notes. But okay, so enough talking about all the different things surrounding Pref Equity. Let's actually dive in and talk about Pref Equity, what it is, the pros and cons, and whether it might be right for anybody listening to invest in a Pref Equity opportunity. Yeah. And I just love the backstory of like how we got to this point too. Mm. So I'd like Mm. to hear a little bit more about just like the market in general and what's neat is that our team has been steeped in this opportunity for the last six, seven, eight months, right? But just like pulling it together, how could it work? How could we leverage this unique market cycle and use all the tools we have in our tool bag, the different regulations, the different funds we can have, how it fits into capital stack, how our investors can benefit from it with just like these new lenses that we have. So give us a little bit of the backstory Mm -hmm. as like where we are and why this is coming now. And it's never sort of been available before or never been presented before as an opportunity Mm -hmm. to the everyday investor. Yeah. So to understand this, let's go back to the last decade or so. Let's say since the Great Recession of 2008, right? We all know how that turned out. But in the wake of that, We've had over a decade of tremendous growth. And everybody thought, I know people who in 2015, 2016 thought were at the top, but it kept going through 2018, 2019. Well, 2020 was kind of a fluke of a year, but we had all this amazing growth. And what's more is that interest rates stayed insanely low during that whole time to continue to grow the greater economy. So what happened was, as the listeners may know, interest rates over the last year or so have started to creep up. So that in and of itself is not a huge issue, but here's where it comes into play in commercial real estate and a lot of these opportunities that we're looking at. So imagine that in, let's say, 2020 or 2021, you were a real estate syndicator and operator, and you purchased a multifamily apartment complex at the insanely low interest rates of that time. Let's call it two, 3%, right? So you're like, yeah, I'm getting this money almost for free. And this is an interest only loan for a period of time. This is great. But a lot of the debt terms around that time were floating meaning that the interest rates would kind of go up and down with the market. But back to 2017, 18, 19, interest rates remained incredibly low. So there was no hint that they would go up. And even in 2020, 2021, the Fed continued to say, nope, we're not raising interest rates. We're going to keep them low. Even in early 2022, they said that. And so everybody trusted that interest rates were going to stay low. And so imagine in 2021, you bought a property with a low interest rate, but it was floating a little bit. And you were like, that's okay. Because over the last several years, it stayed low. The Fed says it's going to stay low. So it's okay. It's floating a little bit. It's going to stay with the market. But just to be safe, I'm going to buy a cap. So a rate cap. So just in case it goes up higher than a certain amount and every operator would have their own risk tolerance. So they would say, okay, up until this certain point, maybe it's 4% or it's 5%, then I'm going to buy a cap for that to protect me in case 
on the off chance that interest rates go higher than that. But there's no way that the interest rates will go higher than that. They've stayed low for so long. Uh, and the I love said. that you brought in like the risk pro appetite of the individuals here. And you think about teams that were just like formulated in that time period. Yes. And maybe they had a couple of years of experience under their belt. But if nobody in their circle, nobody in that team had lived through the last one or had mm-hmm. lived through multiples. Jason talks about on Good Egg, this is my third yeah. version of this. <laughs> I'm like, well, Jason, you're dating yourself, first of all, yeah. but I love it. <laughs> I'm so happy. So you think about that and like how you feel about risk. So some of those cap rates may not have been the biggest cap. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so over the last year or so, as those interest rates have gone up, suddenly it presents a new challenge, right? In 2021, you bought a rate cap for, let's say, two years or three years. Well, now interest rates are much higher. They're still not as historical highs in, let's say, the 80s when they were near 20%, but 5 6 7%, that's substantially higher than a 2 or 3% interest rate. And what that's doing is there's an imminent threat of if you have a rate cap that you've purchased and that rate cap is expiring soon and you do nothing, what that means is now you will be without a cap and suddenly your monthly mortgage and debt payments, they're going to go up drastically and they could change every month as the interest rates go up hopefully come down. But if they go up, then continue to go up, then your monthly debt payments could be substantially higher than what you had projected when you first bought this property. And that is where a lot of owner operators are currently is that they're facing these expiring rate caps and they have to figure out some creative financing solutions to keep the health of the asset so that they don't go underwater. Okay. And so we're seeing all of these owners that with the looming massive increase in expenses that maybe their property is performing really well, but it's not going to pay out investors, or maybe there's just still not enough wiggle room to be able to pay those really high debt costs or the high cost, I would assume, of a new cap, which is maybe too high to even consider. So now we have this need for capital in a very specific way for these really healthy deals otherwise. What happens then? How is preferred equity created and how can other people jump into that? Yes. So I should say first that not every asset needs preferred equity. It's only those that are facing a situation like this where there's a potential capital shortfall So for example, we're talking about you purchased this property in 2021, the rate cap is expiring. Now what's happening is because interest rates have gone up, the values of these properties have in relation gone down. And so here you are trying to refinance. It's a higher interest rate environment and the property is not worth as much as you thought it would be at this point in time. So it's like a double whammy. So this is where the preferred equity comes in because there's a shortfall in order to refinance or to purchase a new rate cap. You're kind of stuck. You're like, oh my gosh, I may have 5 million, 10 million in this gap to get to being able to even break even. And so this is what a lot of people are facing is they can go and get new debt and refinance or they can have the option to purchase a new rate cap but it's going to be expensive. And so rather than do a capital call, which will dilute their existing investors' capital, they're looking to bring in new sources of funding through things like preferred equity, which sits at a different place in the capital stack, which we'll talk about. Preferred equity, when done right, it's a win-win because it saves these assets that are, as you mentioned, performing really well otherwise They're just kind of in a lending pickle, so to speak. There's some issues with the debt. It's not that there's anything wrong with the property itself or the performance of the property. It's just the times that we live in and these properties are kind of stuck in this funky lending situation. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. So we come in as debt. How is this different from being the bank or is this really just a debt investment? 
Yeah. So it's interesting because it's kind of a hybrid. So in order to fully understand the context of this, let's kind of walk through what the overall capital stack on a typical deal, a commercial deal would look like. So typically in a commercial real estate deal, you've got the debt, which is the amount that you're borrowing from the bank. On commercial deals, this is often Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, so these large size loans, sometimes tens of millions of dollars. And so because they're coming in with such a substantial amount of capital, that debt is at the top of the capital stack, meaning the lender, they're going to get paid first. So with any money that's available, they're going to get their monthly payments. The moment you default on any of the debt payments, they could foreclose on the property and take over. So that's really at the very top of the capital stack is the debt. And so you have to pay that out first. Now, typically in a commercial real estate deal, then below the debt is what's called the common equity. And that's all of the limited partner or LP, the investor capital sits below the debt. So the debt gets paid out first, but anything above and beyond all the expenses, the mortgage payments, all of that goes into a pool that then can get distributed among the LP investors. And, and that goes very- into like the preferred return rates that we talk yes. about. That goes into all of those regular distributions, that sort of thing, right? Yes, exactly. That pool of capital goes toward paying out the preferred turn. Oh my gosh, now we're talking about preferred equity. Make sure that when we hear preferred in a passive real estate opportunity, it means I'm going to get paid first. Yes, that's right. And so for anybody who's listening who may not be familiar with a preferred return, typically an LP investment, there's often a preferred return. And if there's a preferred return of 7%, what that means is that for the first 7%, of any of the returns that goes 100% to the limited partner passive investors. So the GP, the general partnership, doesn't get any of that first 7%, which is a great alignment of interest because it ensures that the GP is not going to take on any deal where they're not fully sure that they can at least meet that 7%. So a preferred return is not a guarantee by any means, but it's as close as you can kind of get. This the GP partnership wouldn't do a deal if they weren't pretty right. confident that they were yeah. going to get a good yes. bit more than that 7% because otherwise they're not being compensated for their time either. Yeah, exactly. So going back to the capital stack, we've got debt at the top, we've got LP common equity below that, and then the GP ownership, that sits at the very bottom. The GPs or the real estate syndicators, they typically get paid last. This is a great alignment of interest because they're also the operators doing all the work day to day. So it really incentivizes them to make sure that the property is performing well. Now, where the preferred equity comes in, when it makes sense to bring in preferred equity, is in between the debt and the common equity. So the preferred equity sits above the common equity piece, but below the debt piece. So the lender still gets paid first, but when there's preferred equity that's slotted in, the preferred equity gets paid next. And so preferred equity typically has, sort of like the bank or the lender, they typically have a fixed rate of return. So it's much more predictable month to month. And sometimes it can be a higher rate of return on an ongoing basis, but sometimes it's lower or sometimes even no upside on the back end. So the main advantage of preferred equity is that you're getting paid before the common equity LP investors. Have you been thinking about investing in real estate, but aren't sure you have the time or the desire to manage the investment? Perhaps you're afraid like we were that you'll make the mistake of choosing the wrong market or the wrong team and lose your entire investment. Well, that's exactly why we created the Good Egg Investor Club. We do the work of identifying solid real estate investment opportunities in the best markets around the country and then partner with you to acquire these investments and then we'll all share in the returns. 
We'll identify the growing markets, strong, experienced teams, and the solid deals. We do all the heavy lifting of managing the tenants and the renovations, and as a passive partner, you get to enjoy all the benefits of investing in real estate, monthly cash flow, long-term appreciation, and the ongoing tax benefits. When we first discovered passive investing through real estate syndications, we realized it fit perfectly into our busy lives. We could put our money to work for our families, work less, and get more time back in our days so that we could focus on what matters most and discover our true passion and purpose in life. We've now helped hundreds of people invest passively in real estate syndications and are seeing the positive impact it's had on their lives. We invite you to partner with us by joining the Good Egg Investor Club today so you can start putting your money to work for you and get more time back in your day because we know that when people have more time in their days, they can do the true work they were intended to do and the world will be a better place. To sign up for the Good Egg Investor Club, go to goodegginvestments.com slash invest and we'll take it from there. That's goodegginvestments.com slash invest. Mm -hmm. It is a hybrid of both debt instrument, but you have equity in the deal, like getting the good parts of being the bank. And a little bit of the good parts of being the investors here. Interesting. Yes. I wonder if it might be helpful to throw out an example of like how this might work and what that looks like as the investment moves forward. So like as a refinance, an asset comes up, we've talked about how maybe their cap rate is expiring and they need an extra Mm -hmm. certain amount of money. The preferred equity group comes in and they are able to give them that little bit of extra boost to be able to make their debt payments, to purchase a new cap, for instance, to refinance at a fixed rate, potentially, that is potentially more predictable debt moving forward. So now let's say this asset is held for another three to five years. What happens during that time period? So during that time period, the lender gets paid first as the debt, but then any of the available capital to distribute Before the common equity LP investors get paid out, the pref equity investors get paid out first. So it's debt first. Then next, we look at the pool of available capital to distribute. We pay the pref equity out first, and they're on a fixed rate of return, depending on the deal. It could be 7 8% or more, and that's 7 8% annualized. Just wanted to make sure. So they get paid out before the common equity investors. So there might be a chance, especially in the times that we're in, that there's not enough to pay everybody. So what happens in that case? The pref equity still gets paid because they're ahead of everybody else. And so with the common equity, there's no guarantee that there's going to be a return month to month or quarter to quarter. So only if there's enough money above and beyond the pref equity, then the common equity gets paid. Now, the difference is on the back end when the deal sells, it's the advantage goes to the common equity because for most of the common equity investment classes, they get a substantial piece of the upside. So they're getting paid a lot on the back end, but during the life of the hold, they may or may not get that reliable monthly or quarterly income like the preferred equity investors would. Got it. And you mentioned that preferred equity could share in part of the upside, but they may not depending on what the projections look like or what that all looks like. So there's two things to be aware of for preferred equity investments, especially as you compare them to common equity investments. One is the upside, as you mentioned. It differs from each preferred equity group in the way that they structure their deals and negotiations is different. So for some, they negotiate for a higher fixed rate of return, sometimes 9 10% or more, and maybe no upside. So you're getting all that money paid out month to month up front. And when the deal sells, you don't get any of that. But that drastically, it's a lower risk profile, right? Because you're getting all your money pretty much guaranteed month to month. And you're not taking any chances on the future performance or the sale of the property. Other groups will do a hybrid where they may take a lower upfront fixed 
return, maybe seven or 8%, but then negotiate a piece of the upside. So there's potential for those investors, even in a preferred equity position, to be able to reap some of the benefits of the eventual performance and growth of the property. So that's one thing is the upside that can vary from deal to deal. The other aspect to keep in mind is the tax benefits. So for common equity investors, a big part of the reason you invest in common equity is to share in the tax benefits because you're buying into this LLC that owns the underlying property. And then that LLC gets the tax benefits, the write-offs, the depreciation. And so that gets passed through the LLC to you as an investor. With PREF equity, it's a completely different entity. It's not that main entity. And so it's a different entity. In a lot of cases, especially when the PREF equity is coming in sort of midstream for a refinance, for example, those first year bonus depreciation with the cost segregation, a lot of that has already been taken by the investors, the common equity investors. And so in many cases, there's not as much tax benefit to the preferred equity investors. So that's just another consideration to think about when comparing the two. So it's not that there's no tax benefit. It's that they've kind of been taken a lot. That accelerated depreciation has been delivered out to investors in the early part. Okay. That is new to me. I guess I was viewing PREF equity a little bit more through the debt lens, but it's really much more through the investor lens. I know that those are not necessarily fully different lenses, but it's like the benefits of getting paid first, just like the bank does. That's why the banks are big and wealthy. They get paid first, but you still get some of the taste of the benefits of being the investor too, in a really conservative risk adjusted way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Especially for those who are looking for a consistent monthly fixed return where you're limiting your risk, but also potentially limiting your upside, then those are the people where preferred equity really makes sense. I'm thinking like my mom, right? She's retired. She doesn't have a significant income coming in and she wants to protect her capital. And so this would be a great investment for her to relatively low risk. And she gets that monthly fixed return it's very predictable. For others, it might be maybe you've invested in a lot of different higher risk investments in your overall portfolio. Maybe you're younger, you've got a lot more time to grow your capital. So you've got a lot of capital in these higher risk investments. Well, this could be a great way to balance that out. So in those higher risk investments, maybe like land development, ground up construction, things like that, maybe you're not getting any returns for the first three, four, five years all of the upside is on the back end. So this could be a great way to reap some of that ongoing cash flow in the meantime, so that you have some passive income coming in, which that's how you really create a life by design by using those passive income streams, then replace your salary. And then that gives you the freedom to live your life how you'd like. Wow. It's so easy to look at real estate in a downturn and think like, is commercial real estate crashing? We get that. People kind of saying that all and over. And in 2009, when a lot of people did lose out, and it's true that could be happening right now too. We're seeing some of these assets that absolutely can't bring in more capital and they're foreclosing. And so people are losing everything. And I think that the looming threat of that is a little bit scary, but what is also present during times like this are new opportunities. And for groups that kind of understand the risk sort of keys to play here, to be able to have that foresight, okay, like who is coming out ahead in three to five years? Who is going to find those ways to leverage their capital despite the market and come out ahead? It's like a little bit of a survivor's game. And I like that this is just like another card to play during this time period. You know, we can still invest in great assets, especially that are fixed rates right now that are not going to be susceptible to great massive changes in interest rates, this sort of thing. But what is another option? And what's an option that could really like make us all come out two steps ahead? Yeah. Yeah. And as you're talking about this, because I am an analogy nerd, So what's coming up for me as you're talking about this 
I always feel like I should get one of those posters or prints that shows you like what fruit is in season at different times of year, right? Because I always seem to miss it at the farmer's market. But anyway, Uh let's not talk about supermarkets because they have all the same things year round, right? But let's say it's local farmer's market. Let's say it's the first you're going to a farmer's market and you're going every month and you're like, oh my gosh, right now in the Bay Area where it's blackberry season, right? So there's great blackberries, great peaches. Mm -hmm. But in a few months when you go, you're not going to find those blackberries. And if this is the first cycle that you're going through, you might be like, oh my gosh, blackberries are never coming back. The world is ending. (laughs) I love those blackberries. I miss them. What's going to happen, right? And then you go and you maybe try to buy blackberries, but they're at a higher price and they're not in season and they're not as good. And you're like, ah, no, this is the worst, right? But then if you hang on, then you see that it's actually a cycle because next year around this time, when it's optimal for those blackberries, they'll come back and they'll be juicy and they'll be big and they'll be wonderful, right? And that's how real estate is. It's cyclical. And so we're at a point where it's not like we haven't seen this before. As you mentioned, Jason's been through it three times. Steven's been through it, I think, five times. And so we have this expertise on our team and with our partners that even though personally, I've only been through the 2008 one and now, but we have that expertise on our team And so it's not like we haven't seen this before. And so that's why we're looking into opportunities that are outside the box. Whereas in 2018, 2019, it was all about the standard staples of invest in value add multifamily. Well, things are changing a little bit. The world has changed a little bit. And so if we keep doing the same things, maybe might not work as well in today's market. And that's why we're looking outside the box, being creative, being resourceful, to find these hidden gem opportunities. And that's where Pref Equity comes in. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's pretty cool that we're able to identify it and fit in to places where people just don't see any deals, don't see any opportunities. But if you look for it, it's still there. Yeah. Before we wrap this episode, I just want to shout out the incredible Good Egg community that we've fostered. Because over the years, while we did start with in 2018, 2019, I think each year we did nine or 10 value-add multifamily deals. It was like clockwork almost every month. It was like B-class, C-class, multifamily, Texas, Florida. It was all the same things, rinse and repeat. And people got really used to that. But in recent years, because of the shifts in the market, And this is why we called the company Good Egg Investments and not Good Egg Multifamily, because we knew that things were going to change. And to the credit of the community and our investors, they've come with us and they've trust us and follow us where we sort of see the opportunities. And so we've pivoted, as you know, into self-storage and hotels. And we've now looking into pref equity. We've added crowdfunding for our non-accredited investors too. We've opened up these funds for increased diversification. And so there's just change is the only constant. Exactly. Exactly. You don't want to force something that's not working. You want to open to what's going to work really well. Yeah. Yeah. Just end with this. There's a great quote that one of my mentors It's his favorite quote from Jim Rohn, and it talks about it's not the direction of the wind, but the set of the sail that makes all the difference. And so there's a lot of people out there complaining about the direction of the wind. Oh my gosh, interest rates. Oh my gosh, this market. And you could sit there and do the same thing and keep your sail the same direction, and then you're going to be blown off course. But this is an opportunity for us all to work together to reset the sail, knowing that the wind has shifted and potentially find a new and even better course than we had started on. And so with that, to all of our listeners, I know this was a lot to take in, especially if you're new to the world of Pref Equity There's a lot of moving pieces and we're going to continue to talk about this. It's such an amazing and unique opportunity for this time in the market cycle. But we know that it's going to take more than just listening to it once to fully digest it. So head on over to our blog at goodeginvestments.com slash blog. We'll have resources for you there. 
Also check out our YouTube channel, Good Egg Investments, and we're going to have some videos for you there so that we can all have this collective shared dialogue around what is this new opportunity? How does it fit in with your other investments and your overall portfolio? And is it right for you and your investing goals? So stay tuned for that coming and ongoing conversation. And again, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Life and Money Show. We appreciate you so much and we can't wait to have you here with us on the next episode of the Life and Money Show. See you then. Thanks, everybody. You've been listening to the Life and Money Show, the number one podcast for people who, like you, are living a meaningful and intentional life by design, building true wealth, and making an impact in the world. For more resources, check out goodegginvestments.com and be sure to join the Life and Money Show community on Facebook. And if you got value out of the show, please subscribe and give us a five-star review so we can continue to bring you amazing new conversations. 